Awesome. Thanks, Amy and Stephanie. And thanks to everybody for joining us. I know it's not easy to put everything on hold in the middle of a week to, to join us. So my hope is that this hour would be productive for you and also totally well worth your time. Let's dive into the, the, the question of why Desmos before we get into the details of what it can do and, and how to do those things. So if you head to our about page, this is the first thing that you'll see. This is our company's why. Everything we build is in view of this goal, that students would not only learn math, but also love learning math. We think that's a powerful combination and we pour all of our design, engineering, and teaching skills into that goal. Now it wasn't too long ago that I was in my own classroom and my why back then was a little different. I think it was a little more specific and practical. As a teacher there were four parts to my why as it relates to Desmos. Number one, Desmos energized my instruction. Whole class demos and discussions were a lot easier to facilitate. They were richer, they were more dynamic. Number two, Desmos empowered my students in their small group and individual exploration of important concepts in the math classroom. A whole class demo or a discussion can be great, but for me the results were even more powerful when students got their own hands on the math. Number three, Desmos eliminated barriers to entry for my students, whether they were looking into a specific problem or maybe a topic in general. The interface on Desmos is inviting, unintimidating, and definitely user-friendly. In fact, even though Desmos is packed with advanced functionality, many of these tools are hidden just beneath the surface. So the net result is that students in upper elementary and middle school find it easy to use, but it's also a really useful tool for students in higher level classes like pre-calc, physics, and calculus. And one last thing, number four, Desmos extended access to my students. Because it's available for free and on a variety of devices, laptops, Chromebooks, tablets, smartphones, and so on, my students had access to Desmos in the classroom, at home, and everywhere in between. So, all right, that's enough of the infomercial kind of stuff. Let's dive into some math. Here's my game plan for the rest of the session. I'll do some calculator demos, and then I'll invite you to play along with some calculator challenges, and we'll wrap things up uh, by pointing to some resources and fielding some Q&A. So with that, let me actually fire up a web browser and start with my first calculator demo. So I'm going to go to desmos.com. And here I've got this big shiny start graphing button. I'm going to click that and it opens up a fresh calculator screen. And what I want to do first, I'd like to explore a few different features in the calculator, but always in the context of some actual math content. So it's not in a vacuum. It's not just, here's a cool thing the calculator can do. I actually want to connect the dots of the cool things the calculator can do and what you might be doing in your own classrooms. And to that end, I'm going to jump back over here and invite you to look at this. I'm going to call this stage one of a visual pattern. Just study the structure. It's not super complicated at this point. And my invitation to you is, now hang in there with me, count all of the circles on stage one. Now I, I know that I've got the only live microphone right now, so I'm going to assume that you've either said it in your head or maybe even shouted it out loud in your room. But in stage one, I've got five circles. So on Desmos, I'm going to add a table here and Stage one, five circles. Now to make the screen a little bit easier for you to see, I'm gonna click this button here in the corner and go into projector mode. And then I'm gonna make a big disclaimer that's gonna last for the next eight minutes or so. The next eight minutes or so are gonna be way more of a what can than a how to. And by that I mean, here are things that you can do with Desmos. What can this thing even do? We'll drift into the how to, the step by step and the you getting hands on in a few moments. So if I move faster than you think you can follow along, that's by design at the beginning and then we'll flip that script in a few minutes. Let me readjust my screen a little bit here so I've got a better view. All right, let's go back to my pattern. Here I have stage one. Here I've got stage two. So I'm gonna count those up and however you count them, hopefully you end up with, let's see, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So stage two has eight circles. And now again, following along at home or at work or wherever you are, um, how many circles do you think there will be in stage three? And obviously in the class, I'd give a little more wait time and we'd gather some answers. But here moving ahead, I've got 11 circles. So stage three has 11, and then you might expect that stage four would have, let's see, five, eight, 11, 14, and so on. So here's my next question. How many do you think there would be 
in stage 10. And to help me with that, and at this point, if you're thinking about where this all fits in the scheme of things in your classroom or in the classrooms of the teachers that you might work with, this content is really great for fifth through eighth grade. And depending on the level you're working with, you might um, go further or not quite as far. But if you're working with students who are only tracking with numbers in the table, I want to look at another column. I often call this a helping column, and they're really easy to add to Desmos. I noticed that my pattern went up by three each time. So I'm going to build a three, six, nine, 12 pattern. And I notice here that these numbers don't match. Three is not five, six is not eight, nine is not 11. But if I add two to each of these, now I have the same value in each of these columns. In fact, if I go one step further and add another helping column, the structure comes out even more clearly. Three times one plus two, three times two plus two, three times three, and then three times four plus two. The goal here and the reason that I'm moving through step by step is to show you that students can use these tables in Desmos as a little miniature sandbox to explore numerical or visual patterns to their heart's content. And my hope in my own classroom and the way I saw it play out is that eventually they could see the structure and get to 3 times 10 plus 2 or 30 plus 2, which was then, whoops, 32. And if I zoom out just a little bit more, I can see that last point. And again, depending on the level of student that you're working with, you might even want to confirm that that 10th uh, stage is right in line with the previous stages. So let me jump back here and focus on another topic now. This is a topic that would be great for 6th and 7th grade students. And depending on your students, maybe a little bit beyond that as well. Um, let's say you're shopping at the store and you see apple juice, 6-pack, $3.29. So I'm going to fire up a new Desmos graphing calculator window, and I'm going to try to capture that information here. Six pack costs three twenty nine. So I'll add another table. Six pack three dollars and twenty nine cents. I'm going to go back to projector mode so it's easy for the kids in the back of the class to see, or in this case, the back of the webinar, whatever you want to call that. So if six cost 329. Take a look at this image. I don't know if you noticed it, but there are actually only five cans here. I don't know of any stores that allow you to purchase this way, but imagine we found a store that did allow me to purchase this way. Maybe I wanted an apple juice for me and my four kiddos. So how much would it cost me to buy five of these? That's the math question I'd like to answer, and Desmos is the tool I would like to use. So before I track back to five, let me push ahead to 12 and 18. So how much would 12 cost? Well, one of the things that Desmos is great at is simple arithmetic right in the window. So I've got 329 plus 329. I know that it's going to cost 658 for 12 cans total. Or if I push a little bit further, let's do three groups of 329 to get my 9 87 total. Now I mentioned that this topic we're looking at is proportional relationships and frequently, especially in seventh grade, we might try to represent those proportional relationships algebraically. So what I'm going to do in Desmos is type y equals, now I could do 2x or 3x or 1x or 0.5x, but let me write kx, putting a parameter in the place of a number. Desmos asks me if I want to add a slider. I click to add the slider, and then I can adjust this value until I get just right. Now I'm going to have a little bit of trouble, because 0.5 seems not steep enough, and 0.6 seems too steep. So I'm going to go back to 0.5, 51 hundredths, 52, 53, 54. 55 hundredths seems like a pretty good constant of proportionality for me. And if you're a seventh grade teacher, you might already be thinking about where this might fit in your curriculum, what, it, what unit it might be a part of. Let me go one step further, though, and put a movable point on the screen. This is another little sandbox that I would frequently build for my students. If I adjust a couple of settings and then invite them to drag this point around the coordinate plane to find other points on the line and then explain their meaning in context. So what does this point mean? That's a huge topic in seventh grade. What do the points on a line mean in the context of the scenario? Well, think back to our cans. 24 cans would cost about $13.17. And if I rewind to one can, unit rate is a massively important idea at that level. It looks like about, let's adjust that over here, 55 cents for one can. Or if I push further to those five cans that I wanted, it looks to me like 
275, maybe a little closer to 274. So again, this is more of a what can you do rather than a step-by-step -step how to, but that's a second topic. We looked first at patterns in tables, and here we looked at proportional relationships. Let me go one step further and focus on something that's relevant to a little bit of seventh grade work, but a whole lot of eighth grade work and beyond, and that's linear equations. Let's start with something in slope-intercept form, something like a quarter x plus 3 or maybe plus 1. Notice what's happening in the coordinate plane every time I make these adjustments here on my expression list. Every time I make an adjustment, the results are updated instantly and automatically in the coordinate plane. And in terms of allowing students to grapple with the math, to wrestle with the ideas, that instant but free-form feedback is a really powerful thing I saw play out in my own classroom. Let's push this one step further though. I'm going to turn this graph off and put a generalized version of it, y equals mx plus b. You've noticed several times before that I've clicked this blue button to add sliders. Sliders are a great way to move quickly through a variety of, in of individual cases, whether it's for an equation or a point as we saw on the previous screen. So if you want students to explore the meaning of slope and how the slope parameter in the equation affects what happens in the coordinate plane, or maybe if we pause that and play the same game with the y-intercept, students can gain a lot of insight by dragging these handles, updating these values manually, or hitting pause play to watch this update dynamically as well. We call that last one hands-free mode at Desmos. Let's take a look at one more thing, and then I want to turn the corner and invite you to actually do some tinkering yourself. My thought is, it's nice to see what the calculator can do, but the most fun will probably be had in actually getting your hands on the product as well. So let's take one last uh, calculator demo, and here I'm going to look at a variety of linear equations and even push toward inequalities. So if you've ever used a graphing calculator, you're probably familiar you're probably familiar with this form, y equals 1 half x plus 3. This is slope-intercept form, and actually as a student, when I'm using that handheld calculator, I thought the only way you could graph something was if it was in y equals form. Now, you can totally graph y equals form in Desmos, but you can also easily graph things in other forms, like standard form, or one of my favorites that I actually learned about on Wikipedia, believe it or not, is two intercepts form. One of the beautiful things about Desmos, and this is especially true if you're on a touch screen, although it's pretty simple on a non-touch screen as well, is if you click on points of interest, Desmos will highlight the information relevant. So it's almost like tap on a point and Desmos will reveal the secrets of that point. Here I've highlighted my two intercepts for that green line. And watch what happens in the coordinate plane as I adjust things in the expression list. Let's change that denominator of the x term to a 2, and a 3, and a 4, and a 5. And as I invite my students to explore what the values in the equation do, let me back up, how the values in the equation affect what we see in the coordinate plane, they very quickly, because of that responsive feedback, get a sense of how these two different representations are linked. And it almost, it upgrades their, their skills. It makes them more powerful mathematically because they see these connections more quickly and more clearly than before. Let me adjust the denominator of the y value as well. And you might notice that we're changing the y-intercept. Let's leave the intercepts at 0, 0,4 and 2, 0 and highlight another point of interest, and that's a point of intersection. So Desmos is a really handy tool for looking at systems of anything, really. Systems of linear equations, systems of nonlinear equations, um, systems of inequalities even. And to that last point, let's actually convert these three equations to inequalities. Now if you teach Eighth grade or beyond, you might have some familiarity with teaching students linear inequalities or any form of inequality for that matter. What I want to do here is shade this triangular region. And to do that, I want to shade above the green line. I'll do that by adding greater than or equal to. I want to shade above the blue line. So I'll replace the greater than, sorry, I'll replace the equal sign with a greater than or equal to. And then I want to shade below the red line. And I'll do that with less than. Notice that when I use the strict inequality, Desmos automatically gives us a dotted boundary line. 
And when I convert that, throwing the equal sign in there as well, the boundary line is converted also. Then I might ask students to plot points in the solution region, so 3 comma 0, maybe 4 comma 0, maybe 3 comma 1, and so on. And we might end up with some class debates about whether things like 2 comma 2 actually count as solutions as well. One last thing here. I've got some OCD issues, which actually serve me pretty well sometimes. Um, I'm going to change the color of all of these points to black. And then we might also add some other points that are not solutions and maybe make those purple or orange or something so that we can see visually what is and is not a solution. So there you have it. There are four walkthroughs for what can you do with the calculator. Um, I'd like to turn the corner and invite you to play with the calculator. For me, if I was in your shoes, the last few minutes may be informative, but the next few minutes I think will be a lot more enjoyable and engaging and interesting. So here's how this will work. Uh, students can actually participate in pre-made Desmos activities. More on that in session three in this series, so come back to that one in January if you're interested. We'll have the exact date at the end of the, the webinar today on the last slide. Anyway, um, there are activities that students can participate in, and getting started is about as simple as anything I've seen in a math classroom. Students go to student.desmos.com, so I'll demonstrate that right now. Student desmos.com and whether they're logged in here in this case you see that I am logged in or not logged in I'll actually click sign out to simulate that uh, they have the ability to enter a class code and get started right away so if you wanted to play along with some graphing challenges from wherever you're sitting right now you would type in the code 85UG or if you're interested in tables you would use this code inequalities sliders restrictions images, etc. Just to demonstrate, I'm going to pick the sliders code, 85UG, 85UG. It's not case sensitive, so you can go uppercase or lowercase. I'll hit submit, and then I will type in my name and hit go. And then what you'll find on the other end of any of those codes is a brief set of graphing challenges. We've put these together, um, and I'll point you to these later on so you can play along uh, later on, either on your own or with your colleagues or with your students. Um, quick intro message, and then I click to go to the next screen, and I've got a challenge. Use row 1 to plot a point in the first quadrant. So here's what I'll do for the next little bit. I'm going to take a break from talking with uh, slash at you and let you explore the calculator from your own keyboard. I will leave this screen up full screen for a little while. If you want to play along with points, use that code, tables, use that one, and so on. If you get halfway and you think, all right, that was a nice introduction, I want to play with another calculator feature, you can come back and pick a different code. Or maybe if you finish early and you want to come back before we move on, you can do that as well. I'm glancing at my clock right now. I've got 10.57 my time, and I'm going to give this about 10 minutes, and then I'll jump back in and we'll move into the next next. Uh, next section of the webinar. So happy tinkering, happy uh, graphing challenge solving, and if you have any questions, now would be a great time to drop those in the uh, menu on the side. So I'll turn you loose, turn my mic off for a little bit, and I'll see you in about 10 minutes. So Michael, can you hear me? There is a question. Yeah, I can hear you. Fire away. Okay, so this one might not be completely related to math, but it's graphing. It's about art. Oh, yeah? Okay. Um, is there um, other a way to go in or show someone about some of the different other features besides just graphing or graphing art, tables like that? So if I understand the question correctly, it's related to maybe students or teachers or other folks using Desmos to create mm -hmm math art, if I can call it that. Sure. Yeah, so here's what I'm going to do. And if folks are still working through uh, the challenges, that's fine. Uh, if anybody wants to tune in, I'm going to go to desmos.com slash art. And here are some staff picks of various art projects that students have done. And there's actually a range of, of reasons students do these projects. Some of them are simply because they got interested and excited and, and wanted to do something, and others are actually class projects. Uh, sometimes, you know, end of a unit or end of semester project. You see we've got minions right here. They're actually quite popular. And if I click on that 
image, that little thumbnail, it'll show not only the student's creation, but how they created it. And this is one of my favorite ways to invite students or teachers to explore how to use Desmos, um, maybe in a more uh, uh, advanced way. So you can open up folders to see the equations. In this case, we've got a lot of equations with restrictions. You can turn folders on and off to see which part of the graph those um, algebraic contributions led to in the coordinate plane. I can turn off an individual line, and I don't know if you can see it on yours. Let me see if I can zoom in to this line right here. But I've discovered that this little line right here, I'll try to put it right in the middle, this line contributed that part of the drawing. Let me zoom out again to get the whole picture on screen and close that folder up. You'll notice that this student or teacher, whoever this is, has organized their work uh, in a way that made a lot of sense to them. We've got lines, vertical ones, other lines, parabolas, things that are not functions, so a lot of conic sections and parabolas possibly in there, circles and arcs and various things, and then here we've got a beautiful looking lawn that actually came from just a single expression here. So I don't know how much that graph in particular or the desmos.com slash art page uh, addresses that question, um, but there's a whole bunch of student created artwork here that we just keep our eyes on and occasionally add new things to this pile. And you notice it goes on for, for quite some time. Um, and there's also another uh, another page. I won't spend any time looking at it, but if you go to desmos.com slash recent, you'll find not just staff picked things, but just recently, like what are folks building with this over the last few minutes, hours, or days? So I'll hop back to this slide and, and ask, you know, how well does that get at the question that was, was asked a moment ago? Oh, I think that's great. Um, also, I was curious too about some of that. Um... Wonderful. Yeah, um, yeah, that would be great if you wanted to walk through one of those challenges as well. Okay, let's do this. Maybe, um, I don't know if this is something we can ask some folks and you can keep an eye on their responses in the chat, um, but which which topic would you like me to go through? And I can let, you know, Amy, I can let you, you decide that, or if you want to take a popular request uh, from the side, that's fine as well. Mm, you, you can pick. Okay. Um, I didn't get a chance to look at the uh, survey results from the beginning. Do you have a sense of whether we're working with a spread of teachers five through eight, or it's a little heavier on the eighth grade side? I think it's the younger crowd. Okay, then I'm going to go with tables because that's something that's pretty universally applicable. So BS6U. Again, to get started on any Desmos activity, your students will go to student.desmos.com. BS6U. And I'll hit submit, type in my name, and then here I've got a set of graphing challenges designed to stretch and strengthen my Desmos table skills. And then this is actually a sneak preview of a resource I'm going to point everyone to in a few minutes. It's learn.desmos.com in general, but for tables in particular, you can go straight to learn.desmos.com slash tables. Uh, we've got videos interactive um, tours, and then these graphing challenges you can also access from that website. More on that in a moment. Let's actually dive in to the challenges. Add the points 2, 1 half and negative 4, 4 to the table. So I'm just going to type in 2 here. And if I was just working on my own, I probably wouldn't go to projector mode. But here, maybe it's easier for everybody to see, so I can switch that. And then to get a fraction, one of the reasons that we built the challenge this way was to show off some of the functionality that might not be obvious um, from the get-go or just at first glance. So you can easily enter fractions in Desmos two different ways. Well, at least two different ways. I'll show off two different ways. One of them is by typing the numerator and then hitting the forward slash on a keyboard. That creates a fraction template where the first thing that I typed is added in the numerator or, or shifted to the numerator. And then I can type in my denominator of the two. So I've got two comma one half. Let's go to the next row and actually type two comma one half a different way. If you'd like to get the fraction template right away, 
you can go down here to the Desmos keypad. Now sometimes the keypad hides if you've already closed it, but you can easily click to show it again. And then if you hit the division symbol right here, that will add a fraction template. And this is actually great if you have a more complicated numerator, like one plus three or X plus one. That's a little beyond the scope of the challenge on this screen. So I'm just gonna type in my one half. Now you can't see it, but to get from the numerator to the denominator, I'm just hitting up and down on my keypad. But you can also use the mouse, or if you're on a tablet, you can simply just touch the screen to move the cursor wherever you want. So I've got two comma one half. Those are two different ways to get that on the screen. Let's also type negative four comma four, negative four comma four. So I've got two points in my table. That's it for that first challenge. Uh, quick side note, and this is more, again, a preview for session three if you come back to that one later on in the year, actually at the start of next year. Um, as a, as a teacher, I can see all of my students' responses to this challenge, and that's a pretty exciting thing for me. It's beyond the scope of what we're gonna do in this session, uh, but if you're curious about that, what does this look like from the teacher's side? Uh, I'll have a link for you at the very end for that as well. Let's take a look at another challenge. Challenge number two, create a table of three points that completes this visual pattern. And here we're using visual pattern in a different sense than I did earlier in the webinar. Here is just something visual, and I notice that I've got some dots here, and some dots here, and no dots here. So I'm going to click to highlight the points of interest to, to get their information. It says create a table. So I could have just entered these points, you know, one comma one. That's not in the right spot necessarily. Um, but actually, the directions are to add a table, so I'm going to follow the directions. Create a table of three points to complete the visual pattern. I notice that my x value here is 9, and my x value here is 13. So I'm going to make a guess that my x values in between are 10, 11, and 12. And an interesting thing just happened. Um, I typed 10 and 11 and hit return on my keyboard, and Desmos thought, okay, I think you're establishing a pattern. Let me continue that pattern for you. And if it wasn't what I had in mind, I can easily type on top of that. Now, what are the corresponding y values? Well, I've got one comma negative one, two comma negative two, and so on. I think I see a pattern. I think it's gonna be negative 10, negative 11, and negative 12. And as I look at the picture here, and maybe I even wanna zoom in a little bit to see if that's working out, I think I've done a decent job on this challenge, which is a pretty good thing because I helped write the challenge, so hopefully I'm able to solve it as well. Now, some of these challenges, students might not know how to get started, and we've, we've dropped a hint occasionally uh, to invite students to um, uh, maybe use one little bit of, of a, a nudge or a push forward to, to solve the rest of it themselves. Let's take a look at challenge number three, and then I think what I'll do after challenge number three is maybe go back to the main part of the presentation, open it up for some more Q&A. So the directions here, create a smiley face. Now a lot of it's done for us already because this whole uh, challenge is all about learning tables and some of their functionality. Functionality. And uh, here I want to change these points to be movable, these blue points right here, and then I want to place those in the spots of the eyes. And I haven't decided yet if I'm going to go traditional or kind of Picasso on everybody here. But here's what's important to know about Desmos. If you click and hold, you'll get a magic menu that pops up. Now, if you don't like the click and hold action, you can also click on this gearbox at the top of the expression list, and then a single click here will bring up the same menu. I'm actually a big fan of clicking and holding. About a half a second later, a menu pops up, and you can change the styling of the points. So here I've got dots, connected line, or connected line with dots. Um, I'm gonna go with just the dots here. You can change the color. I kinda like the blue for the eyes. And then there's different draggable options. I'm gonna go with the last one, which is bi-directional dragging. So I can actually move these points vertically or horizontally or both. And then notice what happens. And I'm gonna continue dragging the point here on the right. And I want you to keep your eyes, sorry for the pun, on what's happening on the left in the expression list. So if I move this point, the values update automatically. Now, I mentioned that earlier in the webinar, that what happens in the coordinate plane 
affects what happens in, I'm sorry, what happens in the expression list affects the coordinate plane instantly. You've got that dynamic link between these representations. But the reverse is true as well. What happens in the coordinate plane affects what you see in the expression list. And that can be a great way, again, for students to make those deep and lasting connections mathematically. So I've got these two eyes. I mentioned Picasso, like maybe you want to put this here and maybe I want to get a nose that looks kind of goofy in between. But let's go back to a, a traditional um, set of eyes. And uh, one last thing that might be worth pointing out here. Let's say I put the eyes in the wrong spot. Uh, over here I've got an undo button. Now the undo button is maybe my favorite button, not just in Desmos, but in like computer life in general. So much so that every once in a while my brain finds itself wishing I had an undo button in life. If you click that, it undoes your last move or set of moves depending on whether or not you click and hold and maybe didn't let go for a while. And so it'll take it back to the beginning or maybe you did a series of moves and it will undo those moves one step at a time. Anyway, we'll take a look at the next one. Here's a little maze and your task would be to create a series of points in a table that are connected from start to finish. So even as a, a learning opportunity, not just for students to learn the software, but to even learn more about the coordinate plane, look for some patterns, maybe even more advanced students thinking about linear functions here, this could be a great thing to use in your classroom. And you'll notice we've got a few more challenges. Um, here we've got parabolas, here we've got linear regression, which is pushing to a, um, an older audience, for students anyway, that'd be great for maybe ninth through 12th grade. And then we've got triangles here and reflections. So there's definitely some eighth grade action in that one. And then you get a, a nice big thumbs up, kind of our version of a digital high five at the end and an invitation to either learn more or test out what they've just recently learned in the calculator. So there you go. There's a tour of one of the uh, graphing challenge sets. And I think I'll go back here. And Stephanie and Amy, what do you think about turning our attention to some more Q&A? I don't know how many questions we're gonna get, but I'd love to open it up if folks are interested in that. In fact, maybe 10 seconds before I go there, um, everything you've seen so far has pretty much been centered around the calculator, which I've got highlighted in green here. It's www.desmos.com. And then there's that big red getting started or start graphing button. And I've also mentioned it a couple of times. So sorry, this is going to be longer than a 10 second uh, discussion before we go to the Q&A. But this is probably worth showing for about a minute or so. Learn.desmos.com. So without um, trying to patronize anyone, if you want to learn Desmos, you should go to Learn Desmos. And that's learn.desmos.com. And what you'll find there is just a simple question uh, to answer at the very beginning. What do you want to learn about today? And is it the graphing calculator? That's what today in this webinar has been all about. But I've also mentioned a couple of times there are classroom activities. So maybe on your own you want to learn about those. And we've even got uh, some information about professional development uh, there as well. I'm going to click on the graphing calculator link and it brings us to this lovely menu of a bunch of different calculator features that you or your students in class or on your own time um, kind of by your own choice, or maybe it's a, a department or a class assignment, can dig into some of these calculator features. So we've looked closely at tables. It's in alphabetical order, so we got tables here on the bottom left. Uh, but students can also learn more about sliders, restrictions, a little bit about statistics. For older students, we've got polar graphing, and for calc kiddos, we've got integration and derivatives. Graph settings is relevant to everybody. Just really a, a big menu of lots of resources. And let's take a closer look at tables since we're already somewhat familiar with that. We've got a quick intro blurb just trying to get people familiar with what's on this page. A brief video. Most of the videos are about 45 seconds to two minutes long. Some are slightly longer than that. We've got an interactive tour that'll teach you the basics in a very engaging and uh, easy to follow way. You've already seen the graphing challenges, and then we've got some example graphs. Just really neat things that students or teachers have done with Desmos tables. And then below that, some ideas for related calculator features that you might want to learn more about, or that your students might want to learn more about. And then, of course, an easy way to get back to that 
full menu as well. So sorry for the false start on Q&A earlier, but I think that's maybe one of the most important things anybody would get out of this webinar. It's not just why Desmos, it's not just what can you do or a little bit of you know hands-on how to do this stuff, but it's really having access to those rich resources for your own study later on. So all right, without further ado, let's jump to some questions if we have any. Yeah, I believe that's all the questions that I have. Okay, um, wonderful. Yeah, and um, I th think that if anybody else has a question, you can enter it now. Otherwise, I will go into our closing script. Um, and yeah, do let you me, have any? Let me just put... Um, for these... Um, I'll just put this screen up and leave it up while you do the closing script. And for anybody oh, who is following along live or maybe you picked up, you know, after the fact, this is like right now it's May 12th for me. Maybe you're watching this on May 16th or something like that. Um, if you want to tune in to session two, we're going to do that October 6th. These are all Thursdays and they're all at 1030 a.m. Pacific time. Uh, and then session three is on January 12th. Session two, uh, the plan for now anyway, is to dive deeper with the calculator. And then session three, we're gonna jump into teacher.desmos.com, which is where the activities live. And you can do some tweaking of activities and, and even there's some options for editing activities uh, as well. So anyway, if you wanna connect with me on Twitter, I'm at MJ Fenton. If you wanna send me an email with a question or a comment or anything like that, you can reach me at michael at desmos.com. And Amy, I think that's all I've got on my side, and I'll, I'll let you close us out.